The Prime Minister has warned Britain is facing its greatest threat since the Cold War. How can we improve our resilience on the home front? I'm Jerome Starkey. This is World at War. And my guest today is General Sir Richard Barons, one of Britain's foremost military minds and a former Joint Chief of Britain's Armed Forces. General Sir Richard, welcome to World at War. Thank you. Is Britain ready for the threats that we keep hearing that we are facing? No, of course, Britain is, is, is not ready for the world our government is saying that we now inhabit. The government is saying we're, we're pre-war, that we've got to deter countries like Russia and be prepared to go to war. And if you go to war, that means you must be capable of sustaining real hardship at home. That's what resilience is. But the fact is, for the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War, we've not worried about being invaded or fired at or our daily life being taken apart. And now we're going to have to rethink that from scratch. Let me start there with the government's assumptions. Are they scaremongering? Is this political manoeuvring? We've got an election coming up. The Conservatives want to look tough on defence. We've heard about an increase in defence spending. Do you, do you agree with their characterisation of the threat? Is it accurate? I, I absolutely agree. I think this is something that has been evolving for at least 10 years. One benchmark would be the Russian invasion of Crimea. But the UK, like our neighbours, lives in a world of new existential risk. And it's a combination of a multipolar world, the rise of, of China, the behaviour of countries like Russia, but also the instability that's going to be caused for sure by population growth and climate change, and then all the effects of the digital age and the evolving proliferation of nuclear weapons. So th th this is not the safe, comfortable world that we felt when Russia, quote, went away in 1990. So what do we need to do about it? What does this mean for the man and the woman on the street? So the most important thing is every citizen in the UK has to recognise that we now live in a much harder world and it's going to cause us to make different, difficult choices about what we spend our money on. So if you take the armed forces, they are in a state the Cold War has left them. They now need to be put in a state where they're ready for this pre-war world, particularly deterring Russia. Is it more, more money for the armed forces? So that's going to cause um, the money that we spend now, which is about £50 billion a year, to be spent better. And then there is going to have to be more money. And when we think about that, the bill is bigger because of the current state of the armed forces, for reasons we can explain, but no longer excuse, but also because the US is going to stop paying so much of the bill. The US pays about 70% of the bill for NATO right now. The US has been saying for 10 years, oh, wealthy Europe, you're going to have to pick up your end of the log. And whatever the outcome of the US election this year, that's going to be true. So the bill will get better. And then there is the other end of this, which is the country has to be resilient. And this is not something you just give to the government or the armed forces. We need... Is that having, is that having a, a torch in our, in our loft and a few bottles of water for an emergency? Or is it protecting the nuclear power stations from, from cyber attacks? No, it means all of these, these things. So, so the, the, the way the UK lives its life is, of course, vulnerable to military action. The sort of missiles that fall on Kiev could fall on London and Kyiv's air defences are way, way better. I mean, could the they? We're just so far away from the countries which pose us threat. I mean, you know, Russia has intercontinental ballistic missiles, but realistically, you know, they haven't used intercontinental ballistic missiles in Ukraine. They, they've yeah. used tactical ballistic and cruise missiles. C could those weapons, they'd have to scramble aircraft down, you know, through, through the Norwegian Sea, wouldn't they? I mean, how, are they, how is Russia or China going to launch missiles at Britain? So even a quite elderly Russian cruise missile, I'm going to cite the KH-101, released from an aircraft over Western Russia, arrives in London 90 minutes later with a 500 kilogram explosive warhead and an accuracy of two meters. So pick your door in Downing Street and they'll come probably in clips of 60 to 90 at a time based on how Russia has performed. Now, that isn't imminent, but that's technically possible. But, but if you were wanted to fire at the UK, you might fire from Russia, but then you've got to cross Europe you're more likely to fire from the Atlantic, from the Baltic Sea, from the North Sea, or use an aircraft. So the UK can be attacked as an island, 360 degrees. And could we defeat that attack? As you know, If that attack happened tomorrow morning, could we defeat it? No, of course not. So the, the UK does not have the air and missile defence that Ukraine has for now. We've not needed it. There's a big conversation going on in government about how you do that. It's quite a big problem. It's probably a £4 billion problem, but it's going to be part of this uh, of this age. But that's just 
the armed forces part. What, what we also need to think about are citizens who are braced for this sort of difficult world where maybe they wake up one morning and there's no electricity or there's no water or the supermarket distribution systems have been broken or the banking system is down or the Wi-Fi doesn't work. And, and they need to play their part in it because you can't just ask the government to fix that, although the government's got a big role to play. But, I mean, is that just a state of mind? Have people got to be, you know, do you mean the, the scouts mentality? So I think it is. There's a big state of mind and, and we should recognise that for, for all the reasons we talk about every day in this country since the advent of the smartphone, as it happens, we've produced some young adults who have never been further away from that state of mind. So we may have a journey to, to travel here, but it is a state of mind. It's also some practical things like having some food and some water and a, and a torch and a torch battery. And then knowing what to do if the country's having a really bad day. It's not the end of the world, it's just a difficult day. And everyone then plays their part in fixing it. And, and this happens in the physical arena, you know, um, safety, the functioning of infrastructure. It happens in, in, in the cyber world, the networks we rely on. And then vitally, it happens in the cognitive domain, the things we get from our phones, and we have got to be resilient enough to either trust or not trust what, what our phones are telling us and, and behave as responsible adults. And I think some of the Scandinavian countries have encouraged people to get radios, old-fashioned so transistor radios. What, what simple steps could people take in this country? What, I mean, what, what, tell me, what, what do you do to be, in order to be resilient? So, w without becoming the total prepper, um, I think it's important that people recognise our modern daily life is quite fragile. So just have a few things in the cupboard that will get you through 48, 72 hours of the shops being shut or no water or no power. But mostly this is about adults thinking, well, this actually could happen um, and, and our part in it is to be resilient. In the same way that we need companies and institutions and governments to be ready for their part in a harder world. This, this is a team effort. Is the government ready? I read really alarming uh, reports uh, recently that there is no national plan for how to sort of cope in this kind of attack. Well, we haven't had to think about it for more than 30 years. In the, in the Cold War, there were plans for the continuity uh, of government and for sustaining uh, critical services to the, to the public. We haven't needed to think about that. Actually, there are two dimensions to it. There's a military dimension which is how do you fend, defend the UK as part of NATO deterrence, because it has to be credible, and if necessary, a NATO uh, military operation. That's for the armed forces, and it's not something they've had to think a lot about for some time. And then there is this vital part that the UK must recognise that if you're a country like Russia and you want to deflect the UK from asserting its interests and, and, and its values, the target's not going to be the armed forces. The target is the man and woman in the street who who, if they're not strong enough, simply complain to the government and ask them to just give up. That, that is not in the UK's interest. That man and woman in the street, do they need to be ready to take up arms and fight? Are we at that point? So if you look at the war in Ukraine, we're being reminded that really big wars for the survival of your country are fought, won and lost by civil society mobilised and, uh, and industry. And the regular armed forces have an important part to play, but it's quite a small part to play. So we need to recognise that it is possible in this century, it's not imminent, that we might have to mobilise more military effort. And if you do that, then you ask for volunteers and you need the armed forces to have a mobilisation plan supported by industry, none of which really exists right now. And then just as Ukraine is finding out now, if that war goes on long enough and is hard enough, then you have to mobilise people frankly, whether they're volunteers or not, that's called conscription. It's the last resort. But if the alternative is that your country is swept away, that's what you're going to do. General Richard Barons, thank you very much. We need to be more resilient, prepared to be resilient, and perhaps, if I understood correctly, ready to take up arms to serve the country in extremis. Uh, my name is Jerome Starkey. You've been watching World at War. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below and we'll do our best to answer them next week.